goodness. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so I'd like to start off with my own, my own Maryland story. Um, when I first came here, it's hard coming into a new position. And she was one of the very first people that pulled me aside to personally encourage me to do two things. Number one, do what I always thought was right. And number two, not to take blank from anyone, including Dennis, who at the time was my <laughs> boss. Um, and, and I think I did pretty good with that. What would you say, Dennis? Um, but she was an amazing woman. She'll be sorely missed. And uh, she touched me deeply as well. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some things that are going on locally. Um, our work spans across the Gulf of Mexico and wider Caribbean. But there's been a lot going on on southeast Florida coral reefs in particular that I wanted to focus on today. And while I originally, when Dennis asked me to give a lecture this year, um, thought I would focus on water quality issues, and hence this idea of fine line, um, much more has happened uh, since I first came up with that initial title. And so it's not just one line I'm going to be talking about. It's going to be multiple lines, because there's a line of water quality that's very stark on our reefs. There was a line of Hurricane Irma, and where that track went very much dictated a lot of environmental changes across our state. And then lastly, we've had a dramatic disease invasion uh, up into the northern part of the Florida Reef Tract, and it's a disease that manifests itself as a very distinct line moving across the coral. So it's multiple lines that we'll be talking about tonight. This is, uh, this is work that's been developed since about 2010 with a multitude of partners and agencies. Um, the one that really got me involved in working in the Southeast Florida region initially was Jeff Beal. Jeff works for FWC, but he's stationed here at Harbor Ranch. He's a, a marine and habitat restoration specialist. And he was one of the ones that first uh, introduced me to St. Lucie Reef, which I'll talk a bit about tonight, um, and started getting us thinking about how do we not just monitor these changes, but then go to that next step of making recommendations that can result in some kind of improved conservation status for reefs in South Florida? All the folks that are up on top here in the first bullet are all uh, folks that have worked for me on this project over the past few years. Those that are asterisks are graduate students who completed their work specifically uh, related to things at St. Lucie Reef. Um, and the last one of those asterisks, Ian, is still here today. He's not quite done yet, but he'll get there. Uh, everyone else in the middle are folks from Harbor Branch that have also contributed to this project. Uh, Dennis and Kristen, through the Erlon network and uh, other factors, have really been important. A no number of folks out in the aquaculture park, Richard Baptiste, uh, Peter Stock, and Gary Luizzi, um, have all helped to, uh, with some of the experimental work. Jimmy Nelson and Matt Roy have been instrumental in helping us to get in the field. And Tatiana and Gregor Corey Crow have helped us to do some of the molecular analysis, or well, the, not the analysis, but the throughput of the, of the sequencing itself. Brian Walker at NOVA has been a, a key collaborator on some of the recent work. Kathy Fitzpatrick uh, works for Martin County and has been a strong advocate for this work uh, throughout our time here. And then Kate, Andrew, Scott, and a number of folks at F, uh, FDP have also contributed to the work. It's been funded by a number of sources, um, initially with a little bit of plate money, then Florida Sea Grant, uh, the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program, and recently an EPA grant as well. So it's a, a long-term program that I'll be talking about today with a lot of folks working um, a lot harder than me at times on it. So most of you are familiar with corals and why they're important for Southeast Florida. They're this amazing symbiosis between a cnidarian, and a number of other organisms. But the one that seems to be the most important to driving their success is the symbiosis that they have with the dinoflagellate microalgae, commonly known as zooxanthellae, or symbiodinium, or just algae that are inside their tissues. So if you look really small, you see these little spheroid microalga. And this is a true mutualism, where both are benefiting. So the coral is providing nutrients and protection essentially fertilizing the growth of those algae within their cells. And in turn, the, the microalgae are doing photosynthesis and generating sugars that the corals can use for energy. And so the net result of that is that you get enhanced coral growth. So this tight symbiosis results in uh, coral growth rates that are much higher in corals that have the algae versus corals that do not. 
And here, that symbiosis has really led to a lot of success, not just in South Florida, but globally. Coral reefs are very high centers of productivity. In other words, the amount of carbon that's being fixed into a system and driving the energy that provides uh, up trophic systems and into the overall ecosystem. And the thing we tend to care about most in that regard is the amount of fish or lobster that can produce for us. But there's a number of other benefits as well. We have really high centers of biodiversity. Biodiversity is important both in terms of aesthetic appeal as well as ecosystem resilience. We have really important coastal protection uh, facets that our coral reefs provide here in South Florida. Um, you know, if we did not have reef lines along our coast when things like Irma and Matthew come by, we would lose exponentially more houses. We know that our tourism industry here is strongly driven by reefs and reef services, and that high center of biodiversity also results in a lot of potential pharmaceuticals. We have a lot of organisms stuck on the bottom that cannot run away from one another, so instead, they produce secondary metabolites to try to fight one another underwater that ultimately results in things that can fight cancer or fight other issues that we have. So some of these kind of subjective overall uh, benefits can also be tapped into real numbers. And the current global estimate is that corals are worth just under $10 trillion uh, worldwide. And here in South Florida, it's uh, various estimates between roughly $8 and $15 billion per year. Now, that includes every, every one of those potential uh, benefits listed up on top, boiled down into one single number. But one that's a little bit even more tangible than that is that there are at least 70,000, probably closer to about 71,000 jobs that are directly linked to coral reefs in South Florida. So our reef tract here in South Florida extends from just south of where we are at St. Lucie Reef and St. Lucie Inlet, all the way down around the southeast coast of Florida, beyond Biscayne National Park and into the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and out to the Dry Tortugas. And indeed, this continues to extend up and around along the West Florida Shelf, but these are the areas that are within Florida's state coastal waters and managed as part of the Florida Reef Tract. So we have all these amazing benefits. However, corals have been facing a lot of trouble, especially in the past 30 years or so. There's been multiple incidents where we've gone from reefs that are heavily dominated by coral cover, like what we see on the left, to reefs that are increasingly dominated by macroalgal cover. And there's a number of factors that are contributing to that. We have increasing uh, storm uh, frequency and intensity. We know that here in South Florida, we do a lot of beach renourishment activities, and beach renourishment can have negative impacts, including burying coral reefs, including one just off of Hope Sound National Wildlife Refuge. Direct impacts like boat groundings, uh, ship anchors, diver fins, etc., can harm corals. Overfishing or just overexploitation and taking too much out of the system in general can lead to reef collapse. We know that water quality is a problem, and lastly, we've seen an emergence of coral diseases in the past 40 years roughly 36 or 37 new diseases that have been described um, in about the past four decades. So here in South Florida, we have a, particular, a particularly interesting problem where we know we have all of these different stressors that are combined, and some of those we have more control of than others. So for example, it's very difficult for us to predict control when a new disease may evolve in a system. But one of the things we do have a lot of control over is our water quality. We live in a system with nine inlets and six uh, highly managed outfalls, and all of these are in very highly managed watersheds where we control and make decisions about where the water is going to move at various different times. We know that Lake Okeechobee is a really key link in this chain, but it's not the sole driver. and It often gets fingered as the sole driver, and that's certainly not the case. For example, Lake Okeechobee contributes roughly about 20% of the water to the St. Lucie Estuary uh, watershed each year. So it's only about a fifth of the total volume of water that we have to deal with in our, in our region. One of the things to think about, too, is that we know Florida is built on a model of economic growth. Uh, our tax structure favors people moving to Florida. If we don't have people moving to Florida, our state starts to go bankrupt, literally. So increasing populations mean that we're going to have an increasing reliance on water availability and what to do with wastewater in our region. So this is not a problem that's going to go away. And it's probably not a problem that just technology is going to fix. We're going to have to make some hard decisions as well. 
So one of the places that we focused on this issue initially was at St. Lucie Reef. So this is at the very northernmost tip of that Florida reef tract, a really interesting ecotone where you're starting to see an introduction of both tropical species and a lot of temperate fish species in the same location, driving really high biodiversity, about uh, 250 fish species um, on average. And it's also the, norm, uh, the northern limit for about 21 different scleractinian or hard corals along the coast of Florida. So you can still find these corals if you go all the way to Bermuda, but if you keep going along the coast of Florida, 21 of these 25 drop out after St. Lucie Inlet. It's an area that's a really important commercial and recreational fish resource. Um, any of you that were out this past weekend would have seen literally hundreds of boats on this state park um, just offshore, and it's easily accessible, shallow to diving. Um, it is open for recreational fishing and commercial fishing. You just can't use long nets or fish traps or spear fishing. It's an area that's dominated by two coral species, a knobby brain coral called Pseudodiploria and a star coral called Montastria cavernosa. So I'll come back to both of those later on since they're the most important corals on this reef. Now we've been tracking discharges in this area for a long time and we've been able to see changes in the water quality um, visually quite easily when we're out on the water. Um, most of the time we're trying to avoid that nasty dark water not because of necessarily health risks for us, since in most cases we're at a salinity level that will be killing anything that might be potentially harmful to humans. However, it's really hard to see in black water. So we are almost always targeting our uh, surveys and work during times of high tide. But using drone technology and aerial overflights, we've been able to get some really good images of how and when this water discharges out of the inlet and the extent at which it spreads over space and time. So here in September of uh, uh, 2015, you can see this very stark line. And we may think that during the dry season is when we're going to be okay, but the past few years that's not been the case. We've had some abnormally wet dry seasons and some abnormally late hurricane uh, rainfall that's been coming down through the state far into the dry season. So even in the dry season in February or this year into December, uh, we started to see lots of fresh water coming out of the inlet. Um, and then perpetuating onto the reef where we've seen drops of salinity from what's normally about 35 or 36 on this reef down to as low as 16 parts per thousand. So corals and other organisms can withstand that for a short amount of time, but not for an extended amount of time. So it's the duration of these events that matters just as much as the intensity. So we're faced with this set of problems, and what's our approach? We've taken a, an approach basically combining three different things, controlled experiments, exploration and monitoring, and trying to develop some advanced molecular tools. I'm really going to focus on these two on the right today because I presented about our controlled experiments a couple years ago at OSLS. And the goal of these is basically three things. One, to develop new approaches and new methods to try to address these issues. Second, as soon as we have data that's available, we share that with our agency partners and we immediately share the recommendations with those agency partners as well. That usually is a faster pipeline than running it through the publication process and waiting for it to get to them later. It can expedite the process of making a change. And then lastly, I've really been focused on um, trying to get students more involved in both their educational process as well as getting the students involved in the outreach and storytelling aspect of this. And I'll touch on that at the very end. So part of that monitoring is water quality monitoring. Most of you are familiar with our Lobo network, the Indian River Lagoon Observatory. And that's overlaid with some additional resources as well. There's the DB Hydro Network, um, as well as a network of Odyssey uh, temperature and salinity loggers that we've deployed over time. And none of these all overlap together, but there's enough overlap between the three of them that we can get a decent idea of how water quality is changing in these resources at any given time. For field surveys and monitoring, we basically have some nested approaches. At St. Lucie Reef, where we first started this in 2010, we've essentially monitored the same reef sites and the same corals three or four times every year for the past seven years. With some additional funding from uh, NOAA, we were able to scale up and add places in Jupiter and West Palm Beach two years ago. And then following Hurricane Irma with some funding from FDEP, we expanded further um, down all the way to the southern terminus on Palm Beach and then partnered with NOVA and DERM to do the rest of the Southeast Florida region all the way down 
um, essentially to Miami, to the port of Miami. And then we've also developed this really nice optimized pipeline so that every coral sample we get is going through a whole suite of potentially different kinds of analysis. So when we take a small coral frag, usually a biopsy in the area of about four to six square centimeters, so about this big, um, we immediately take a small subsample of that to do population genetics to try to figure out how the corals are related to one another. We also do gene expression. So the same way you turn on genes in response to stress or different stimuli, Corals do the same thing. So if I hand all of you a little bit of popcorn, all of your insulin production genes, if yours are good, maybe not everyone's are, but those are going to turn on and start producing insulin in your body in the anticipation of a sugar hit later on after you've smelled that. Corals respond in the same way. When they get hit with the stimuli, they turn on certain suites of genes, and we can measure those genes being turned on. We then also take a small frag and remove all of the tissue using a little water pick sprayer, just like the same dental water pick you would use, separate out the algal from the coral tissue, and then also scan the skeletal fragment so that we can understand both the morphology of that coral as well as the surface area that was available so that we can scale all of these other measurements back to the surface area of the amount of tissue that we sampled. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about population genetics in this area. And this is work that one of my graduate students who's just finished and gone on to a NOAA Canals Fellowship did, Danny Dodge. Um, we were interested in trying to understand whether or not St. Lucie Reef might be this sink population. It's way out of the end of the Florida Reef Tract. We assume that it is not getting a lot of coral recruitment. We've tried to track coral recruitment there and basically see no new corals coming in. We looked at the reproductive capacity of the corals that were there and found only one coral out of all of them, was even trying to make any sperm or eggs. So based on that, we assumed that this was a sink population where occasionally things come in, but not much gets produced. Much to our surprise, we found that it might be the exact opposite. So we saw relative evidence of connectivity. So on this structure plot here, each bar represents an individual colony, and the contribution of the different colors tells you something about which uh, source population it may have come from. So you see that there's three distinct source populations. All three of those are represented at St. Lucie and Jupiter, but Palm Beach only has two of the source populations. And when we started to look at the patterns of migration predicted by the population genetics, essentially what we saw was that rather than going from south to north, which you might predict based on the Gulf Stream, it was little eddies coming off of the Gulf Stream that were driving coral larvae back the other way. So that occasionally, anywhere from 2 to 20% of the larvae were going from St. Lucie Reef south to Jupiter or West Palm. So we have good evidence of connectivity in this region for this coral. Um, and it's, pretty, it's most likely indicative of what many of the other corals in this region are doing as well. We also want to look at that gene expression component of it. So the first step we did to this was to use a targeted microarray. So using a microarray, you predefined the genes you're going to measure. So we picked about 2,000 different genes that were of known interest and looked at the relative expression or how much they were turned off or on at any given time. So genes here that are shown in green are, are genes that were increased in the amount that they were turned on. Genes that are shown in red were ones that were decreased in the amount they were turned on. And overall, what we found is that during times of discharge, when we had lots of flow coming out of the inlet, we saw an elevation in things like cell metabolism. So if they were trying to ramp up their metabolism to outcompete this smothering effect. We saw an increase in tissue repair genes. So likely there's some damage occurring and the corals are trying to repair themselves. And not surprisingly at all, we saw an increase in osmotic stress genes. So um, osmotic stress is when the ionic balance, salt water versus fresh water, is thrown out of whack. And during times of discharge, we have lots of fresh water coming in. Of course, you would expect to see this. Now, when we first did this, there was not a full transcriptome. In other words, the entire list of all potential genes that a, that a coral could be expressing available. And since then, that has become available. So the other thing that Danny did was to, instead of looking at just those targeted genes, to use a new technique called TagSeq, where you look at all of the genes that are being turned on at one time. 
And she was able to, to look at this, at the changes over three and a half years, roughly, at St. Lucie Reef. And she was ultimately able to map about 38,000 different genes back to the Montastri cavernosa transcriptome. So that's a really high amount relative to a fairly understudied species. But only about 10% of these were differentially expressed. So in other words, the vast majority of genes are just turned on and staying consistent all the time. And it's a small fraction that fluctuate up and down in response to those stressors. And what she found is that by far, when you sampled, or the season in which you sampled, was the biggest contributor to how corals changed. Not when discharge was, not where that coral was, um, but rather when you sampled. So that would suggest things like light and temperature are probably the primary drivers of how these corals are responding. So if you had to ask me where we were at maybe a little, 10 months ago, in May of 2017, I would have told you this. We would have said, we know that the coral populations in Southeast Florida are pretty strongly connected. That's important in terms of management, because that means you want to manage them as one big unit rather than little separate populations. We know that St. Lucie has these really high levels of biodiversity driven by being at that temperate interface. Um, and John Reed had done, done a lot of work to describe that early on as well. We know that the corals are responding seasonally to these different temperatures and thresholds, but that the reefs appeared relatively resistant to these discharges. And this is one of the things that just boggled my mind, that they were continually getting pummeled by discharge events coming out of Lake Okeechobee and the St. Lucie estuary, but the corals seemed to do okay. They weren't necessarily growing, they weren't necessarily reproducing a whole lot, but they weren't dying. They were surviving. So I would have said that they were persistent and resilient, but they were vulnerable because it was a relatively small population and it wasn't reproducing. And I kind of really regret saying this so confidently because I feel like I almost set them up to fail when I did. So shortly after this, uh, our initial studies there, um, in 2014, there was a new disease that emerged, uh, characterized as white blotch disease. So it started uh, right off of Virginia Key, near Government Cut, down near Erasmus, characterized as one of those line diseases that has a very distinct line of tissue necrosis, and it marches its way across the coral. The tissue flakes off, and what's left behind is that bare white coral skeleton. And these were relatively rapid. So for some of the initial infections, it took maybe upwards of a year uh, or two years for a coral to die completely, like this pillar coral sh shown here in the top panel. But then some other infections seemed to go really rapidly inside of a month or so. So this is another uh, pseudodiploria uh, strigosa brain coral in Broward County that was basically completely gone inside of a month. So over the course of two years, that disease started to spread. Initially, it spread very quickly north, about 100 kilometers, and south into uh, Biscayne Bay, about 30 kilometers. And then the following summer, it continued to expand north to about 140 kilometers and south along the northern Florida Keys. And whenever you see this kind of radial discharge and, or radial um, expansion of a disease, that's usually a pretty strong indicator that it's a waterborne pathogen of some kind. Now, we still have no idea what the pathogen for this uh, disease is. There's a number of groups working on that, including a consortium that we're involved with that provides samples to one another to look at everything from molecular biology to histology, trying to identify what this pathogen might be. Um, but there's also a consensus that we don't necessarily need to know what the pathogen is until we do something about it. So we've been discussing a lot of strategies to potentially thwart the advancement of this disease, particularly along this boundary, along the southern Florida Keys. There's a strong desire to keep the disease from jumping the Seven Mile Bridge Passage and making it to Lou Key. So some of the things that have been suggested um, have been uh, treating a coral with an epoxy line that is, pr provides a physical break, um, embedding... Uh, bleach, essentially powdered bleach, into that to help to uh, arrest the disease line. Um, UV sterilization has been suggested as a potential approach. Um, amputation has been suggested where you would uh, physically break the coral and remove the part that was showing signs of disease. 
Um, and even euthanizing corals has been suggested to try to prevent the spread through a population. Um, we're in the process now of essentially getting permitted to try some of these different approaches and see which of those may be most successful and most likely to slow this disease down or perhaps stop it. One of the things that's been most devastating about this has been the effect on dendrogyra. So these are the amazing pillar corals that can be six, eight feet tall. Um, they've never been dominant in this region, but they were certainly a charismatic and easily recognizable kind of coral on many reefs. And it's estimated that they're probably going to go locally extinct in Florida waters. Over 96% have died in the two years, and the vast majority have been as a result of this disease. It's been so devastating that essentially they've gone into full conservation mode where any dendro dryer that's left out on the reef is being sampled and brought into controlled aquaria to try to save it before it dies. With the hope then that once we figure it out, we can repopulate later on. So we basically had two years where we were really hopeful that this disease wasn't going to make it to St. Lucie. We thought St. Lucie is remote. It's at the area where the Gulf Stream typically is quite far away from the coastline. Um, there's not a lot of coral between uh, Palm Beach and St. Lucie Reef. And so we were very hopeful that St. Lucie would be spared. And unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, we got a, a call from some friends, Dave Gilliam down at Nova, that said that some of his folks had spotted a few uh, incidents of infection in uh, this past May. We made it out a couple weeks later to take a look, and we found that it was starting to take off about 14% prevalence, or the percent of corals affected over a given space. Um, seven of the 25 coral species that were there were observed with infection. And at one of our sites in the southern part of St. Lucie Reef, almost half of the brain corals there were already showing signs of disease. So it wasn't looking great. But we also knew that this was a really resilient reef that had faced a lot of things before and done OK. So we were still not necessarily throwing in the towel just yet. Then Hurricane Irma came. Um, those of you that live on this coast and have houses on this coast were, of course, thrilled to see the line move slightly to the west at the peril of our neighbors. Um, but what was interesting is that although the main line in the center of the storm was quite far to the west, this was one of the widest storms that has ever hit Florida such that even though we didn't have a direct hit, we still had quite a few wave impacts in some localized areas up and down the east coast of Florida, as well as just intense amount of rain that flooded the entire center of the state. So we went out uh, just a month after Hurricane Irma, uh, not even a month, um, about 26 days after Hurricane Irma came through. And we were very displeased to find that essentially all of our star corals that we had tracked um, roughly 80% of them were either completely dead or already showing uh, signs of disease and infection. There was only five left that looked relatively healthy. Um, and those were of the individuals that we had tracked over time. That's not all of the corals that were present on those reefs. We found four colonies that had either been completely dislodged and broken off or submerged uh, by sediment scour. And then subsequent to those initial kind of wave-driven impacts, there was this second wave of freshwater discharge impacts. So all told, we ended up with about 60 billion gallons coming out of Lake Okeechobee during a three-month span just after September and just after the storm, all the way until about the first week of December. And if you look at the Lobo data from that time, from the Erlon network, you can see that essentially the entire estuary was freshwater for that entire three-month span. Now, that doesn't mean that it was pure freshwater getting out onto the reef. But it did mean a vast increase in the amount of turbidity and the darkness of the water color, which meant reduced light getting down to the reef and potentially other contaminants coming along for the ride as well. So we started to see these potentially uh, carry-on effects beyond just the original storm damage. So when we went out to do those post-IRMA surveys, we went to uh, just over 60 sites all up and down the East Coast and we saw really high disease prevalence up where we are in Martin County. So the way this are oriented, this is St. Lucie up here. And it basically goes down to almost the end of Palm Beach County. 
and then you pick up Palm Beach County again here into Broward County and Broward County down into Miami-Dade. So this is the southernmost point. This is the no northernmost point. They're just stacked together. So up here in Martin County, all of our sites had really high disease prevalence, over 30% at all of our sites. And down in Broward County, we had fairly high disease prevalence on the order of 5 to 30% at most sites with an increase right down near the Miami-Dade line. But then if you looked in Miami-Dade County, it was kind of more of a mix. And one of the interesting parts was that Palm Beach County had very low disease prevalence. So one of the working hypotheses here was that basically disease had already swept through and picked off some of the corals in the Palm Beach County populations and that wasn't increased during Hurricane uh, Irma. But if you look at storm damage, there's a similar trend in that the northernmost spot up in Martin County and further down into Broward and a little bit into Miami-Dade County, we saw hurricane impacts from dislodged and toppled colonies, but really none of that at all in Palm Beach County. So there could be a potential correspondence going on here where those corals did not get this additional stressor of a lot of sediment blowing around and blasting the reef or corals getting toppled and therefore exposed to kinds of disease. Um, so I don't know if we can say that there is a, a causative agent that Hurricane Irma made more corals get diseased, but I can certainly say that there's an additive stressor hypothesis to be explored. So to update what we've seen since, uh, since last year, we know that St. Lucie reefs really were persisting, but totally vulnerable, and that was bared out as soon as some big events happened right on top of one another. And now when we went out to St. Lucie Reef uh, just on Monday, we saw that those two dominant species, Pseudodiploria, or the brain coral, and Montastria, the star coral, were virtually, uh, you know, really hit hard. Uh, I won't say wiped out, but I would say on the order of 80% of the corals that we had previously been tracking are dead or dying. And those few that were not already dead or dying were showing signs of bleaching, like this large uh, Montastria cavernosa right here. This is about a meter in diameter. So even though we're not in a warm part of the year, and even though active discharges aren't going on, and even though this coral is not diseased, it's still showing signs of stress. It's breaking down that symbiotic relationship with this algae, and the algae are getting expelled from the coral. So that suggests that perhaps there's something else going on here in terms of light limitation from prolonged turbidity in the water column. Um, and then again, we're really looking at a multi-stressor event. It's this combination of a disease invasion coupled with a hurricane, coupled with discharge events on the back of the hurricane that have led to this perfect nasty storm of events causing about 80% of these corals to succumb. So now that I've bummed you all out, now I can tell you a better story. So these are the folks that work for me. They're not fighting Star Wars, but they're going to be fighting some coral wars over the next few years. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting that anyone is anyone in particular, although maybe I am with Mike being the oldest one. <laughs> and so there's a number of areas that we're trying to explore and others that are trying to explore to understand what can we do on a broad scale and local scale to help ameliorate these effects and what kind of uh, reparations can be put in place to bring reefs back. What kind of things that can we do in terms of water quality to prevent some of these issues from happening again in the future on reefs that are still doing marginally okay? Probably the most important hope spot for me is the work we've been doing on mesophotic reefs. So those are those middle light leaf reefs that are roughly from about 130 feet uh, down to on the order of 350 to 400 feet. Um, so they're beyond standard scuba depths, but there's still enough light there to support photosynthesis for the algae to do their thing and for the corals to grow and survive. There's enough overlap in the species that are on those mesophotic reefs with the shallow reefs that potentially they could be reseeding those shallow populations. And in general, those deep reefs are not getting exposed to the same kinds of stressors that the shallow reefs are. They're far too deep to experience any of the kind of wave stresses you might see with a hurricane. 
they're uh, not experiencing any of the, of the anchoring impacts or beach renourishment impacts that you might see on a shallow reef. Um, and in general, they tend to be just farther from any other anthropogenic stressors in general, farther away from inlets, farther away from outfalls, for example. So through the Cooperative Institute, we've been exploring and characterizing a number of these places and then trying to look for evidence of connectivity between those mesophotic reefs and shallow reefs to see if they're already starting to do some of that transfer of larvae from top to bottom or vice versa. Um, and Mike has found uh, some really interesting results demonstrating that in places like the Flower Garden Banks, they probably are well connected and that the mesophotic reefs can totally repopulate the shallow reefs at times. Whereas Ryan has found results completely to the contrary in Belize, where there's two separate populations in the mesophotic and shallow zone um, that are very distinct one, from one another. So if you lost the shallow reefs um, in Belize, they may not be repopulated by those mesophotic corals. So we have to do this on a reef-by-reef -reef basis, and understanding whether or not this kind of hypothesis holds broadly uh, really needs a lot more investigation than just two or three places before we understand how it works. One of the other bright spots has been diadema recovery, or the long uh, black spine urchin. So in places like uh, St. Lucie Reef, we've seen an explosion in the numbers of these urchins over time. And these urchins are really important because they graze down macroalgae that might otherwise overgrow corals. Um, increasing the amount of diadema on Florida Keys reefs in particular can increase the amount of available substrate for coral larvae that hopefully can settle there and grow. There's been a lot of emphasis recently on coral restoration, this idea of growing up small coral fragments that can then be repopulated out into an area that's previously been degraded. And there's multiple different ways in which this restoration has been approached. Some of it has been in situ uh, gardens or facilities where you basically build up huge trees or big platforms in the water column and grow corals in an open ocean environment and then transplant them from those nurseries out onto the reef at some point. There's been six different coral nurseries funded like this. Most of them have focused on Acropora cervicornis, or the staghorn coral. That's partially because it's an uh, endangered species, but it's also because it's very easy to snap off and it grows quickly. So if you want to pick a winner for coral restoration, Acropora cervicornis is probably your best bet here in uh, the tropical Caribbean. In addition, those six nurseries have been testing various different strategies with other kinds of species as well. Uh, Moat Marine Lab in particular in the Florida Keys has tried to do some microfragging approaches where they take a single coral colony and chop it up into a bunch of little pieces, spread them out into a network over a dead piece of coral, and then hope that they grow and fuse back together with one another. And there's been some success with those approaches as well. The challenge with any of these restoration approaches is how do we scale up from tens of thousands or even millions of corals that we might plant out on a reef when we're losing tens of millions or hundreds of millions of corals during these disease outbreaks and hurricanes. So that scaling issue from how we get from growing them effectively to outplanting them with them with, with some success, excuse me, um, is still one of the big hurdles that needs to be overcome in coral restoration. One of the strategies that have been suggested for overcoming that hurdle is to essentially abandon the idea of just trying to, uh, to replace the stocks that have been lost and instead to try to breed super corals in the same way that we selectively breed dogs or tomatoes or anything else. So Ruth Gates has really been the one leading the charge on this idea. And the idea is to identify corals that are in an area that have previously been exposed to some kind of traumatic stressor, be that a lot of heat or a lot of fresh water or something like that. And those corals persist and survive so that those might be hardier genotypes. Then they start to collect all of these different hardy genotypes and crossbreed them with one another, test them against these different stressors, and essentially start to make decisions about which corals might be the ones that are going to be the strongest to survive in the face of climate change or other stressors. So I think it's an intriguing idea, but we also know that any time you do selective breeding of a, of a population, you're at a risk of genetic bottleneck. And so controlling for bottleneck and being able to maintain the diversity of the population at the genetic level, not just the individual level, is important as well. 
Oh, and, and lastly, um, the other point here that I wanted to make is that just because you have a demonstrated population that has seemed to be really, really tough in the face of a, def of a number of stressors doesn't mean it's impervious. If you had to ask me to pick one of the strongest coral populations in the world, strong strongest coral communities in the world, I would have put my finger on St. Lucie Reef and said, these corals are amazing. They can get through anything. But yet, they were one of the ones that succumbed when they were hit with multiple stressors. So suggesting that a coral that can handle a few stressors may be able to handle all stressors is certainly not a universal truth. In terms of improving water quality, we've made a lot of headway here in Florida. So uh, the main legislation that was passed in, in 2008 has actually a number of the milestones along that path have already been reached. Um, the legislation said, number one, there's going to be no new outfalls. And that's been adhered to very easily. Number two, that we were going to get to 60% water reuse by 2025. And right now, we're on the order of 20% working our way there. Um, and then finally, this idea to remove all outfalls by 2025. Um, this is still on track, still slated to happen. Um, it was, uh, there was a legislation introduced to postpone that, but it was defeated. Um, and there's already been some bright spots, like Delray Beach beat their target on the order of decades and has already closed their outfall, for example. Probably one of the most important things for this region just happened on Monday. And that is that Rick Scott just signed into law a bill that a number of us have been pushing for a very long time, and that is the creation of a coral conservation area in southeast Florida. So this essentially is going to draw one big box from St. Lucie Inlet all the way down to Biscayne National Park, extending out in, uh, into the extent of Florida state waters. And while there's not yet a state appropriation to support and implement um, any kind of strategies in this box, it should allow for two things. Number one, it should allow for greater enforcement of existing Magnuson-Stevenson rules regarding coral uh, impacts. And number two, it should open up this area to some federal funding because it will become a designated MPA, which opens it for a whole other suite of federal appropriations as well. So that's scheduled to go into effect in 2019. There's going to be numerous uh, incidents in which, and opportunities in which um, the public is going to be encouraged to comment on potential uh, management strategies within that zone. Um, so I encourage you to look out for that and to weigh in with your opinions and thoughts accordingly. Um, and then lastly, this was also supplemented by a little $1 million, I say little, um, by $1 million appropriation to study disease, um, $1 million split up among 43 people gets small quickly. <laughs> so we've got these positive things, but there are still some things that you can do. Um, in addition to supporting that kind of legislation, I think one of the first things we need to do is really address the issue of climate change. And this is both in terms of how you vote and how you spend your money and the choices that you individually make. So I would encourage you to be cognizant of what your carbon footprint is. It doesn't mean necessarily that you get rid of your car, but it does mean that you start to think about, okay, how much should I drive my car this year and are there things that I can put money towards that might offset the use of that car? I think we need to encourage more responsible boating and diving here in South Florida. Um, and that starts at a very young age. Those that learn to do it early on typically uh, stick to it their entire life. Um, and it's generally e easier to teach those young folks how to do it right from the very beginning, I would argue. Um, again, supporting those marine protected area implementation plans. Try to avoid eating things like grouper. Choose a faster growing species like mahi or even better, lionfish. Um, and then <laughs> lastly, I would say, um, you know, be advocates. Try to make sure that what you're sharing is knowledge that you can base in fact and science and support so that you're spreading information that is useful to others. Um, we deal with a lot of misinformation or fake news these days, right? And I would say that in this field in particular, the information that we have is changing so rapidly that it's sometimes challenging. So. Look at websites like ours. Look at websites like FDP for the latest information that you can and try to use that in supporting or making the decisions that you do. So that's what I suggest you guys can do. What are we going to do 
to try to ensure that there's still corals here in the next 80 or 100 years or so. One of the things that we're trying to do is to expand our research on a collaborative network on a regional scale. Um, so we're doing a lot of work now with Cuba. Um, we're partnering with roughly 32 different agencies all along the Southeast Florida corridor that are all collectively putting their data and information together to help design the management scheme for the Southeast Florida Coral Conservation Area. I think we need more experiments. We do a whole lot of monitoring in the field, and monitoring in the field can only get you so far. It's never going to answer the question of, is that the actual problem or not? Doing more experiments is about the only way to do that. Believe it or not, those economic numbers that I gave you for coral reefs are probably horribly on the low end. So the reason for that is that we still have not mapped a, a large number of coral reefs that are available on this planet and that are resources that are important and drive both our ecosystems and our economy. So those numbers probably need to be uh, readdressed and that also needs to incorporate new findings of mesophotic reefs, for example. We really need to improve our capacity for predictive management. What I mean by that is that we need to be able to suggest to an agency that when they make this difficult decision, here's the most likely scenario that we think is going to happen, and here's our confidence around that. Furthermore, here are the tools for you to measure whether or not that impact was a good choice. Far too often, we're, we're put in a situation where uh, administrators or at a, a state, county, city level, federal level need to make a decision and they're paralyzed by the lack of being able to predict what might happen and therefore the decision is not made. So the more predictive capacity we can give them, the better off uh, they'll be able to make that decision with some confidence and at least be able to say, no, 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 that's what Josh told me was going to happen. Um, and then lastly I would say, and I've, I've, some of you have heard me say this before at a, a previous OSLS about um, drones, but really enhance the storytelling aspect of it all. The data and numbers are compelling in their own way, but telling the story is compelling in a different way and often reaches a different audience and often reaches in a way that may have longer, uh, longer fingers in society than just your data might alone. Um, so it's something that, especially for those younger folks in the room, I would encourage you to always think about not just What's the story that your data is telling, but what's, how are you going to turn that into a story that's compelling for an audience outside of just science? So here's some examples of folks in my group doing that. Here's Mike down at St. Andrews teaching them about scuba. Um, I go down there about four times a year. Um, since my kids are at St. Andrews now, it makes it nice and easy. Um, there's lots of opportunities to tell these stories. And if you are looking for a way to volunteer, and you enjoy storytelling, this could be a good way for you to get involved as well. If you want to learn more about us, here's where we are. Thank you all very much.